Well, we are into November. And in November, we inevitably come around to thinking about gratefulness and giving after we've made that attempt to overcome our fears with Halloween and have expressed our gratitude for the saints who have loved and lived before us, we start thinking towards Thanksgiving and cooking and traveling and shopping and not to panic, there's still plenty of time for that. But then something special happens in December. The first Sunday of December will begin the season of Advent for our Christian calendar. Our year starts again in December. And one of the ways that we um, observe Advent is by putting out candles and by putting on robes. So I'm always glad that we're not wearing the robes when this particular gospel story shows up in our reading. Particularly that part where Jesus says, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and have the best seats and places of honor in the banquets. So, yeah. But robes really are not a bad thing. One purpose of wearing robes in worship is actually to not draw attention to yourself. Its purpose is to draw attention away from the individual who's wearing it. Because when we don't have robes, when you might be thinking about what color I'm wearing or what size it is or whether it fits right, without robes, the individual size and style and maybe even wealth is noticed and evaluated. And so wearing robes in worship is really intended to keep our focus on God and not on the people who are standing up there. But robing is sort of used as a way to establish an air of authority, which is why judges wear them. And they're worn in university convocations and graduations to set people apart, part in recognition of the accomplishments and responsibilities of those involved. And, and, you know, judges need to have an air of authority and respect in order to do their job. And maybe graduates deserve a little bit of recognition for the hard work that they've put in for their accomplishments. So robes aren't necessarily bad, and and I don't think Jesus is really knocking robes in this story. And he's also not condemning all of the scribes of his time. I think I I sort of see two things that come out of this story, and, and one relates to how we use our power, and the other is reminding us that wherever we are in our lives, we always have something to contribute In our story, Jesus is inviting his followers to notice the person behind the robe. Beware of the scribes who like walking around in their robes so that they will be treated with more respect because maybe that's more respect than they deserve. In our story, the role of the scribes was very important to the people around them. They wrote the legal documents the issues and the rulings on law and business, they were pretty much in control of their culture because they had the words and they wrote the words and basically they were the ones who controlled the language. Because only around 10% of people could read or write at that time. And those who could write wrote the rules. So scribes had power and therefore they were prosperous. But Jesus is blaming all the scribes. He doesn't ever try to set up an us versus them scenario, but he is asking us to notice people's actions. Because in the story we read just before this one, he is asked by a scribe teacher, which is the first and greatest commandment, and the scribe and Jesus agree on the answer, that it is to love God and to love one's neighbor, and that's more important than all of the offerings and the sacrifices you bring. And he affirmed that scribe. He said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. But he wants us to notice the people who have the power to help or to hurt and who use their power to take advantage of the powerless. Beware of those who wear long robes and say long prayers while they are devouring widows' houses. And that's not just an empty phrase. The devouring of widows' houses refers to the distribution of inheritance to widows. The scribes had the legal responsibility for these kinds of transactions when someone died, 
and the houses would be the only inheritance left from their husbands in a culture where women did not own things. The devouring is what happened when the scribes overcharged and basically stole a significant part of their income. Now, what might that look like today? Maybe an example of devouring widows' houses might be when the executives of a certain company don't want to pay the pensions that they have promised their employees. So they come up with a scheme. They can transfer the part of the company that owed the pensions to a newly incorporated subsidiary. And then they can bankrupt that subsidiary. And thus, the company is released from the obligation to pay those pensions, and the people don't get paid. Workers who would have counted on those pensions have now nothing to live on, and spouses of deceased workers, the widows, are suddenly destitute. Have these executives devoured widows' houses? Yeah, they have. And I suspect many of them would be sitting in church the next Sunday thinking, well, that's just business. Jesus' words, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. Now this is usually read as the praise of the woman and we have a tendency to just sort of stick with that part of the story. Maybe because that's the easier part. Katie Stanup points out that Jesus is telling this story not only to point out the differences in power and to remind us who it is that we should be standing for and standing by. But she says, I think this story is also true because it is true that those who are closest to being poor actually give the most to those in need. She continues, I'm convinced that those who have experienced poverty give the most because they understand what it means to have nothing, and they and we appreciate it, what we have even more. She says, I say we because I have experienced the grief of poverty and debt, and as I begin to rise in prestige and power and money, I hope that I never forget what it is like to pick which bill you aren't going to pay this month. Or to scrape together all the change in the house to send your child the money for a school activity. It is a word of praise for the truth that those who have less tend to give more. But along with being a word of praise, this story may be closer to the truth when we view it as an indictment of the system that makes the poor poor in the first place. Jesus is highlighting the absurdity of a system that makes someone poor and still expects them to give out of their bare subsistence. For the widow of Mark 12 is the same widow of Psalm 146 and the same widow of Scripture that God promises to uphold and protect and to do justice for. And it's the same widow that is walking with her children to our borders for help as we worship here in peace. But again, Jesus is not pitting scribes against widows or lawyers against workers. He's asking us to pay attention to how we use our power. And when we read the story, we usually focus on the widow and her giving her last two cents. But it's not a call for you to give your last dollar, for you to leave yourself destitute. It is a call to use the power that you do have for the good, for the good of others, for the good of society and family and strangers, for the good of those most in need of help, so that they too are then able to better help others. The widow didn't have much power, and yet what she had, she wanted to give to the greater good, to the temple that represented God to her, in spite of its flaws. She wanted to contribute to the community that she lived in. 
Each person has something to contribute to the work of the church, to the needs of the people around them, and to the world. Even someone who may appear to have as little to offer as this widow in our story has the power to choose how to use what she has. We have time. We have the power of time to participate in ministry with others. We have the power to pray, to lift one another for strength and wisdom. We have the power of words to give comfort and encouragement. We have the power to vote. This widow couldn't have voted to change the people who had the power to devour her house and to cause such harm. But we do. And we have the power to write and to call and to text and to email on behalf of those crushed by a system that they can't control. Because we are the children of a God who notices and protects the unnoticed. We are called, therefore, to be agents of God's grace on behalf of those who feel powerless. Our psalm reading is meant to remind us of who this God is that we have come here to follow. Happy are those whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, the God who executes justice for the oppressed and who gives food to the hungry, the God who sets the prisoners free, who lifts up those who are bowed down, the God who watches over the strangers and upholds the orphan and the widow. This is our God. Maybe one good contemporary illustration of what this widow's generosity might look like in our time and our place is in Osceola McCarty. Osceola was an African-American woman from Mississippi who earned a living by washing and ironing other people's clothes. She never married because she was in the sixth grade when she had to leave school to take over her mother's laundry business so her mother could care for a sick aunt. And she said, well, my classmates had gone off and left me, so I just didn't go back to school. I just washed and I ironed. She never owned a car. Only once did she get a window air conditioner for her home. Her arthritis forced her to retire at 86, and she finally died at 91. But throughout her life, she scrimped a little and she saved a little until she was able to leave behind $150,000 to the University of Southern Mississippi to set up scholarships for other needy African-American youth. And then when she did that, contributions from more than 600 donors tripled the value of that scholarship fund. She said, I want to help somebody's child go to college. I just want it to go to someone who will appreciate it, who's, to someone who can learn. I can't do everything, but I can do something to help somebody. I wish I could do more, but I will just do what I can. Sometimes I think we will be surprised to find that we have more power than we think. So this question that the scriptures give us today is how will you use your power?